Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a medical and science-focused podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Metabolic Health Summit is the world's premier scientific and medical conference on metabolic health and therapies, featuring world-renowned expert speakers, cutting-edge science, an innovative expo, and incredible networking opportunities. MHS is altogether an unforgettable experience for anyone interested in metabolic health. I think Metabolic Health Summit is amazing. It does such a phenomenal job of bringing world-renowned experts in different illnesses and metabolism, real-world experiences, clinicians, patients, paired with vendors who are trying to make this easier for people. You know, I think for everybody who comes, including myself, learns something. Join us January 25th to 28th, 2024 in Clearwater Beach, Florida, or attend virtually. CMEs are available. Go to metabolichealthsummit.com and use the code LINK to save 10% on your registration. Hi, welcome back to another episode of The Metabolic Link. I'm Victoria Field here along with my co-host, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, Dr. Angela Poff. Hey guys, so good to see you. Hello. Hey, Victoria. (laughs) Great to see you back again. Yes, yes, back again. I had to take a second, have a little human, (laughs) give birth to a little human, and now now we're Priorities, yeah. Yeah, we're so thrilled to have... uh, a son in the mix now and back from maternity leave, um, back in action and still playing mom duty at the same time. So it's awesome to see you guys again and dive into the science uh, on metabolic health and metabolic therapies. Um, we've got a lot to talk about today. Some really cool papers, a couple of papers, actually one of which um, that's by one of our speakers that's coming out to Metabolic Health Summit 2024. Um, for those listening, watching, If you've not got your tickets yet for Metabolic Health Summit 2024, definitely snag them while you can, while they're still available. Uh, We have in-person and virtual, and it's going to be held January 25th through the 28th in Clearwater Beach, Florida. Amazing place, right on the beach, um, right back where it all started, actually, where you guys are are located, uh, Angela. So it's kind of a full circle, um, which is cool. And we've got some incredible speakers coming out um, to just share the latest science on metabolic health and metabolic uh, based therapies. We've also got an amazing gala dinner uh, that honors two incredible nonprofits, the Charlie Fan Foundation and Max Love Project. That's an, such a fun time. And then a VIP mixer. So you can meet the speakers and uh, mix and mingle and network with other uh, incredible entrepreneurs and professionals in the space. Um, So go to metabolichealthsummit.com to uh, check that out. Um, Today, though, we're going to dive into some research. And Angela, you were going to jump in there. Oh, well, I was also going to mention, you maybe mentioned it and I forgot, but or I didn't hear you. Um, So you can also come virtually too. So uh, obviously Clearwater being there in real life is going to be awesome. But um, in case you're, you know, pretty far away or last minute can't swing the travel plans, definitely join us virtually. So if you just go to our website, there's virtual tickets as well. And CMEs are available. We, um, we're offering 19 AMA PRA category one uh, credits for uh, physicians and other healthcare uh, providers. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really a great uh, experience over the course of four days, uh, but you can also get credit at the same time if you're a medical professional, which is really great. Um, and it's just an action packed weekend, really from A to Z, from the food we serve to the presentations that are held. Dom, I don't know if you want to chime in at all on um, maybe any of the speakers that are coming that you're looking forward to. Each year, we kind of try to shake it up a little bit and we've got a pretty cool lineup. Yeah. Um, well, I was on a scientific advisory board meeting this morning with some of the speakers. Jeff Volek is one of them, uh, one of our favorite keto diet speakers. Uh, and Rick Johnson or Richard Johnson, who's done uh, an incredible amount of work on fructose, fructose signaling and the role of fructose in insulin resistance and uh, uric acid. So he'll be talking about that. And um uh, yeah, I'm super excited for the platform talks and also the breakout session. And there will be a breakout session on one of the topics I'll be covering today, which is allulose, mm-hmm. which is kind of a, a sweetener, a sugar substitute sweetener, not artificial, natural, and a whole kind of breakout session on that with some 
leading authorities uh, discussing that topic. So super excited about that. Yeah, no, we've got like such a dynamic uh run really agenda uh for this upcoming year that it's going to be a lot of fun to uh just see how it all unfolds and you know we do sell out we've sold out in the past so don't wait to get your tickets um definitely jump on that and um we hope to see you out on the beach in sunny clearwater beach florida to learn all things metabolic health and metabolic based therapy so um, we have a lot to talk about today and we should just kind of jump right in. We have a couple of papers um, that you'll definitely want to hold on for because um, we're going to start with one on allulose and some of the potential beneficial metabolic effects. And then we're going to dive into, yep, there's the first paper. Dom's showing it on video. If you're if you're watching on or if you're listening on audio, you probably didn't see that, but <laughs> he's showing the paper. And then we're going to dive into fructose and how blocking it might be a novel approach uh, against cancer. So uh, Angela's gonna dive into that one, but Dom, why don't we start with you? So allulose, as you were briefly mentioning, for those who are listening who might not be familiar with what, what is allulose, um, it's actually a sweetener. It's a rare sugar, in fact, that comes, it's naturally found in nature in things like figs and raisins, um, a variety of, of other things, but it's, um, it's kind of got a, a similar chemical structure to sucrose. Um, and it's sort of like its cousin in that it's got, but it's got the, a tenth of the calories. So because of that, that small difference there, it's it's way less in terms of calories, but it has like a similar mouthfeel in terms of how you can cook with it. You still get that myarding, that browning when you cook with it. It's it's really interesting. And I remember when it came out onto the scene, um, it was like the biggest <laughs> breakthrough in sweetener history and probably the last I don't know, a hundred years, um, I would say. And um, it's just been sort of making its way into the market, but it still kind of has yet to be uh, accepted in some places. I mean, you can't really find it yet in, yet in Whole Foods, but um, it will be, it's something that's across the board in a variety of products, many of which will be at uh, Metabolic Health Summit. Uh, but it's a really exciting sweetener because there are some of these potential metabolic benefits that are showing a lot of promise in the research. And of course, we're, we're diving into one of those studies today, which will be a lot mm -hmm. of fun. And Dom, take it away for us on what we're gonna be covering. Yeah, uh, I'd like to mention that it is, I mean, we have Publix down here. It's in Walmart, it's in Publix, uh, definitely on online. And I think in the stores, if not now, coming really soon. Yeah, so, just Whole Foods hasn't yet jumped on the boat, uh, but the bandwagon yet. I think, you know, yeah. for a variety of factors, but it will, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you could like engineer a sugar, uh, it would, you know, that's like a perfect sugar. It'd be pretty close to allulose, I think. So yep. it is a monosaccharide and then sucrose is a disaccharide of glucose and fructose. And then allulose is technically uh, not an enantiomer, an epimer of fructose. So uh, it's super sweet tasting. And I'll be talking about its functional effects, which include uh a GLP-1 releasing effect. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about uh, semiglutide, Ozempic, Wagobi, these drugs. So these drugs, there's a number of different drugs on the market uh, and they have an anorexogenic effect or like a satiety effect and they have a weight loss effect and then uh, an insulin enhancing effect. So one could think that you know, and these drugs work by just activating the receptor, but what allulose probably does is that um, there's, you have cells in your intestine called the L cells. And when you eat certain foods like high fat, keto diets can actually increase uh, GLP-1. And that's through the activation of the intestine releasing something, you know, that actually then activates through an afferent pathway. We have, um, mechanisms that can stimulate the brainstem and control our autonomic regulation associated with our eating behavior. So that's really how allulose is, we think it's working. And that's, that's really the essence of this paper here. The title is, uh, it's a nature communications paper, which is high impact, like 16, 17. It's by a group of scientists in uh, Japan, I believe. And they uh, they did a very elegant study in this Nature Medicine paper. The title is GLP-1 Release and Vagal Afferent Activation Mediate the Beneficial Metabolic and Chronotherapeutic Effects of the Allulose. 
So uh, what they essentially showed is that allulose can uh, impact glucose control by functioning to enhance glucose disposal and act. It also, and this sounds like a negative effect, uh, but it can enhance insulin secretion. Uh, but it simultaneously, and this is where a little bit of the debate comes in. So it enhances insulin secretion and it enhances to a greater extent insulin sensitivity. So if one is consuming, uh, as one is injecting a GLP-1 uh, agonist, that they will eventually have lower levels of insulin over time due to the weight loss, but also due to the insulin in, uh, sensitivity enhancement of insulin sensitivity. And that kind of gets lost when people like debate the pros and the cons of it. However, the, the big problem is that GLP-1 um, receptor agonists are super effective anti-obesity, anti-diabetic agents, but they have really considerable side effects that you have to consider. So, uh, and that can include nausea, vomiting, uh, different types of cancers. I think thyroid cancer is, is higher. And uh, there's also psychiatric conditions that can be activated uh, or stimulated. So there's, there's a lot of debate about the different side effects, uh, but they have such amazing side effects on people losing weight that can kind of overcome many of these effects. So the allulose is very interesting because it does not cross the blood brain barrier. So it is working at the level of the gut, the, uh, the L cells, I think in the gut uh, trigger the release of that. And what this study showed is what the investigators studied was uh, they study it was a mouse study, uh, C57 black six mice. They demonstrated that D allulose causes a, a release in GLP-1, and this abolishes the uh, the hyperphagic response in mice during the light period. So mice are not supposed to eat so much in, in the light period, and that's this eating behavior is kind of sort of analogous to just like hyperphagia at nighttime, like a disrupted circadian eating pattern. So it essentially abolished that, and uh, and it basically you know, on, on paper, this, this, um, allulose looks really mar remarkable and it's doing it through the vagal network, the vagal afferents and, um, the, the vagal afferents tie into like the lateral hypothalamus and that integrates all the signal signals associated with eating. And that can include CCK and, uh, PYY and all the different, you know, peptide hormones, we call them incretins that are associated with eating behavior, nutrients, sensing, metabolism. So uh, it's working through that path pathway. And if we kind of just follow the figures in the paper and go to like the first figure, so it talks about D allulose suppresses, uh, and this is a figure one of the paper, suppresses food intake without aversion. And the the way they administer the D allulose to mice to suppress food intake was uh, in the paper, they talk about injection, which is very confusing. But if you delve into what they were doing, they use the word injection, but what they're doing was a gavage, which is basically using a syringe needle to uh, give the allulose at a precise dose to each of the mice through an intragastric gavage. So like essentially two feeding. So when they injected the allulose uh, IP, so, so they also talk about injecting IP, but this is actually with a syringe needle. They inject IP and it had no effect. So you do need to consume it to get the beneficial effects. Uh, there's a couple papers showing like enlarged kidneys with allulose at high concentrations, but no pathological effects in the animals that had uh, the slightly larger kidneys. Uh, they looked at kidney function, which was normal. And uh, what kind of dose were they using um, in the gavage? Yeah, that. Yeah, because when you think yeah. about versus humans and what we might be comparably yeah. consuming, great, very great different. Question. <laughs> yeah, so that that was like one of the first questions. I have a notebook here of all the different calculations of what they're giving. So uh, they use essentially the biggest effect, and other labs use other doses was one to two grams per kilogram. 
So okay. that that's kind of high. But if you do the dosing equivalents for someone my size, a hair over 100 kilograms, that would be uh, the human dosing equivalents of that, according to my calculations and the metabolism of mice, would be 20 to 60 grams of allulose a day. So in our, I've consumed 60 grams of allulose a day. I gave, I ate an RX sugar bar every hour for six hours and it didn't really, <laughs> now if you just, I was if wondering just, how did you do that, Dom? That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, the bars Anything don't the have to, yeah. If you consume pure allulose at 10 grams, so a bar is 10 grams of allulose. And if you do that on an empty stomach, that catches up with you and then that causes GI bloating and upset, but the bars lot, though, to get yeah, there for GI distress. Yeah. Yeah. The bars have like, you know, they have a little bit of protein. They have uh, cocoa powder, they have cocoa butter, they have soluble fiber uh, and then they have 10 grams of allulose. So just that, you know, the calories and that, that affects buffers the allulose. So my threshold is like, you know, I can eat at least one bar per day. And every time I ate a bar, a chocolate bar, which tastes amazing, my glucose went down each time throughout the, the six hours. So that was pretty enlightening to me. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So getting back to the dosage, uh, one, two, three grams per kilogram, the human dosing equivalent for my size would be like 20 to 60 grams per day. However, if you look at, which is sufficient enough that the oral administration via intragastric gavage, and it really is important to because you can get a gavage effect. So some of the animals actually lost, like trended to lose weight just mm -hmm. by gavaging saline. Because when you do this, it stresses out the animals and they self-restrict, but the effect- Which is something we see in our lab. We yes. do, um, and even the dosing you're talking about is, is it sounds high like that that dose, but it's actually, it's close to what we you know work with, for example, in yeah. exogenous ketone, um, studies in yeah. our lab in the rodents, um, we tend to, to use doses in this range of like even higher, like five to 10 or seven, you know, grams per kilogram, um, uh, for the animals. And the, as Dom's talking about like this human equivalent dose, mice rodents have very different metabolism. So there's actually like a lot of math <laughs> that has to be done to, um, to figure out just because a mouse might be getting like one to three grams per kilogram, what does that mean for a human? So it's not nearly as like outrageous as it sounds. Yeah. Right. Like we did our first study was 10 grams per kilogram <laughs> of a ketone ester. And that completely like, oh. you know, uh, had an, an amazing neuroprotective anti-seizure yeah. effect. If you weigh a hundred kilograms, uh, that would be consuming one liter of ketone right. ester. So that's like it's the human dosing. Not at all. It's not, a, it's way too much. Yeah. For Good luck with that. Yeah. I don't bad. know how that would that's, go down. It would not be safe. Yeah. yeah. No, not right. safe and not palatable either. Yeah. yeah. So mice have a metabolism like seven times faster, uh, rats, maybe like five times or something. So we're talking about a dose that, you know, is a, that you can get, especially if you spread, you know, 20 grams through three meals or something like that. Yeah. It's so, like, you have to think of it as like a food, right? Like that's the same for yes. like androgenous ketones. You, when you think of like a, a, a pharmaceutical, you think of these like, you know, microgram doses or milligram doses, but a food you're think you're talking grams, right? Not yeah. tiny. And even ketones are calorie containing substances. Yeah. But so a little bit more about allulose, like it's essentially kind of like zero calorie because you excrete it like part through the gut and through the kidneys. There has no glycemic index, uh, no sugar crashes, no tooth decay, no aftertaste, you know, all that you can bake with it. Um, and it has sort of like these effects on ghrelin, lowering ghrelin and leptin. And uh, so there's a lot of research behind it. Uh, and it's, it's, it is something that could truly kind of replace sucrose, which is, you know, it has like this baking effect and you can bake with it and do, and it lowers yeah. A1C and there's human randomized controlled trials with it. And it is, uh, it can cause, GI upset, but the threshold is about 50 grams per day, according to the randomized controlled yeah. trials. It's much different than say some of your other sweeteners that can cause it a yeah. bit sooner and lower doses, you know, and, and yeah. something like erythritol, where you start getting like a cooling effect as you increase in dose where you don't get this same kind of. Yeah. So, and it's like, 
low food map, like the FOD map, like it's like, you know, uh, acceptable for, in that category. And, uh, right. you know, it has all these other like functional effects, which are really interesting. But so that dosage, human equivalent dose of like 20 to 60 grams per day caused a 500% increase in GLP-1 secretion at one to two hours. And then it came back down. Uh, this is with an intragastric gavage and then came back down within, within about like three or four hours. So that's pretty, that's like impressive. That's like essentially like drug-like effects on GLP-1. Uh, right. Mechanistically, you know, and it's doing it through uh, like the next figure is basically they look, looked at GLP-1 specifically secretion and they looked at GIP. So there's this new drug out like there's Ozempic, but then there's Wagobi and then Wagobi is a GLP-1 and also maybe it has some GIP activity. But GIP is really associated with um uh, with release of insulin, like a high, so you really don't want a, a GIP effect, although they're marketing like that, of course, the pharmaceuticals do, but you really want more of a GLP-1 effect. Um, if you consume, if you bolus glucose, you know, in your vein, you're going to reduce the, the GIP effect. You're not going to get a GIP effect. So it's it's totally through the guts. It's part of the incretin. That's why they call it incretin. Uh, hormones. So there's very little GIP effect. There's no CC, uh, cholecystokinin. There's no CCK effect. And uh, PYY, which is another uh, peptide that has a satiating effect, was not increased. So all the beneficial effects, at least from allulose, from the insulin sensitivity to, you know, lowering blood glucose, uh, is due to the GLP-1 effect. And that spiked up really high. And the error bars on it were like, really small so it's like they had a, they had a pretty uh, consistent effect uh and the the d allulose caused this anorexogenic effect which is basically the animals didn't eat or they food restricted and this glucose disposal effect and they did a what was really made it like a nature communications paper is that they did uh, pharmacological blockers of the glp1 receptor and that completely blocked the response mm -hmm. And they also, they had knockout mice where they knocked out the receptor and then they gave allulose and didn't get the effects. So uh, so that was really impressive. And if you kind of scroll through and go to figure five. Hey, Dom, before you move on real quick. Um, so for the control group, were they were they comparing to like a glucose um, uh, control or what was, yeah, I mean, was it saline or glucose? Cause so obviously, you know, carbohydrate meals, mm -hmm. Glucose will stimulate GLP-1, but yeah. is the benefit essentially, and I'm not like an expert on those medications at all, but is the benefit essentially this idea that you're stimulating GLP-1, which is sending this afferent feedback up to the brain, um, sending effects like, hey, you're you're satiated, you're, you're full, um, releasing insulin, doing all of the, these things, but in the absence of the calories that are associated with glucose or carbohydrate meal, you're just getting the like benefit of, of telling your brain that you're full when you're not. Is that essentially yeah. how those drugs work? And, and so for like allulose, for example, because it's essentially non-caloric or very low calorie, that's mm -hmm. why you have a, the same kind of benefit. Yeah, I think so. What they, a limitation of the study is that they didn't use, like there's various peptides and, you know, even amino acids that have effect on uh, GLP-1, like releasing effects and PYY, like tryptophan yeah. and phenylalanine, like these amino acids, when they're in high concentration, the food that we eat are natural, like yeah. releasers of these peptides. And I don't know, I mean, 500% elevation and secretion of GLP where it's measured, you know, in the, in yeah. the blood, that, that sounds like really impressive to me. But I couldn't really find any unambiguous <laughs> like data where they do or compare something similar to it. Yeah. Uh, but the drugs are kind of in that category, like low doses of these these drugs are kind of work in that capacity, like about a you know four or five, you know maybe even a couple, even a thousand or more times higher. But they are almost like pharmacological like effects. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but without all the um, potential yeah. side effects with it tasting kind of similar to sugar, it's uh, yeah. really 
fascinating what that could mean for, you know, when it comes to weight loss and the potential it has and folks who are trying to lose weight, you know, maybe don't want to go the pharmaceutical route, but want to just eat something that tastes sweet. (laughs) That could be game changing. Yeah. And, you know, the, the data that they have here, they did it like, it was almost hard to criticize some of these studies. If you look at when I, when I think of something that they didn't do, they include it in the supplementary uh, (laughs) data. And so it is really uh, a very elegant study. There's incredibly um, uh, elegant study in the level of detail that they put into to really show that it's working through the GLP-1 receptor uh, with the knockout models and, and the, the pharmacological blockers. So, so I, you know, I, I think kind of that's like the take home message and we can talk more about the science kind of of it, but, uh, and the implications of this. And I, and I think this really can be recognized. What I, what I think the importance is, is actually designing diets. Uh, what, when I think about, when I read this literature, I think about the problem that we have with low carb and ketogenic diets being unpalatable Mm -hmm. and the use of artificial sweeteners, sucralose, aspartame, um, you know, erythritol, maybe one of them, saccharin, like these things are, can be questionable, you know, their effects, they're hyper, they're, they're so hyper palatable because they're so potent. Whereas allulose is a very mild sweetener. It's maybe about 70% of the effects of sucrose and, and it has many similar kind of properties. Um, and it truly does have like these functional properties in regards to, uh, you know, altering the endocrine system in a favorable way that makes it like, you know, just having so many different benefits and, uh, and some of the the data I wanted to to kind of highlight was, you know, people within the low carb community kind of talk about that this drug, you know, causes the release of insulin, and that's bad. But it also has an insulin enhancing and potentiating effect. And if you can, if you administer this after eleven days, baseline insulin was significantly lower after 11 days. And I think like that's really, it's not the acute response to these drugs when you administer it and you have a higher insulin response to food. It's what happens to baseline insulin over time when you take the drug and how does it alter, you know, metabolism. And I think, you know, the randomized controlled trials clearly show that these have remarkable, you know, metabolic effects and potentially cardiovascular uh, benefits and potentially even with FTG PET scans, even uh, improving brain energy metabolism. Do you love learning about metabolic health? So do we. It's why we created the Metabolic Initiative, an online educational platform providing evidence-based education on metabolic health and therapies for healthcare professionals and the general public. By joining the Metabolic Initiative, you'll gain access to hundreds of expert lectures, interviews, panel discussions, and even private episodes of the Metabolic Link. CMEs are available. Go to metabolicinitiative.com to get started. And as always, thank you for listening to the Metabolic Link. Are you talking about the GLP-1 agonists right now, right, Dom? Yeah, yeah. So okay. then that, so the GLP-1 agonists are showing, you know, these effects and, uh, but they do have real side effects. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when you're tinkering with the endocrine system, sure. you got to expect that. So uh, a more elegant way to basically have a GLP-1 effect is to stimulate the L cells to then secrete your own GLP-1. And then you're kind of you're kind of gaming the system in a way. I mean, we do that naturally all the time, every time we eat, right? But, and there are components within food. And I think this is a very fruitful area of research to research, whether it be polyphenols, different types of uh, foods. I mean, actually there's even some types of fish and amino acid, you know, peptides in fish that actually can stimulate PYY, yeah. you know, and different macronutrient combinations and different types of food constituents that can augment you know, many of these drugs associated with enhancing satiety and uh, general just metabolic response, you know, beneficial metabolic effects. So 
I, I, I don't think allulose is unique, but I think it is probably the most well studied component sweetener that not only can replace sugar, but imagine the effects of just if we switched out sucrose and sugar sweetened beverages with allulose and yeah. you know all yeah. these other products you know and even if, yeah there wasn't like kids oh yeah, yeah. Ma massive i mean even if there wasn't like a complete overhaul of your diet right you're just switching out some of the sweet stuff and then you know seeing sort of what happens i think you could still have a dramatic effect with something like allulose um considering how much sugar people consume not even knowing it through soda through you know, all of these uh, little breakfast, <laughs> breakfast is notorious for packing on sugar without people really realizing it. And just making that simple switch just for one meal a day, what kind of impact that could have on, you know, just how many people with diabetes and metabolic disorders that might benefit. So yeah. really exciting research. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're going to be diving into this topic, as you mentioned, Dom, at Metabolic Health Summit in, in more detail um, with some of our great speakers. And uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun to really unpack what 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 do we know so far? What do some of the top minds in the space really think about this? Um, and also get the opinion of the community, the, the people that are in, in attendance too, because I think a lot of people have opinions around allulose and sweeteners in general that replace sugar. Um, so it's going to be a fun dynamic conversation for sure. <laughs> one, one last thought. I mean, this is a mouse study, but there are human randomized controlled trials where they right. get it and they give a predetermined dose of carbohydrates of glucose with and without allulose. And yeah. the postprandial rise in glucose is significantly lower when you take it with allulose, the same level of glucose. So uh, that's super interesting to me because it's like inhibiting the sucrase enzyme for one thing, which could, you know, buffer that. And then just the insulin sensitivity effects. Also, I've noticed, and it's been reported that when you consume it and you exercise, like it facilitates glucose disposal when you exercise. And I think there's a paper on an enhancing glut for translocation to the muscle. So it helps the muscle take up more glucose. So a lot of, a lot of really interesting research to unpack. This study was five years ago, believe it or not, to 2018. Oh, wow. So, uh, oh, wow. That's uh, so topics. I'm surprised I did. Yeah. 2018. Wow. And, uh, and it kind of set the stage. I think it'll probably get more attention now as more attention has been directed to the GLP one yeah. drugs. But yeah. Um, yeah, just a super interesting area of research and molecule to be studying. Agreed. Yeah, no, excited to dive more uh, into more detail at the conference about this topic specifically. And, and it's just, it's really uh, interesting to see how many different companies are getting really creative with allulose as well uh, as mm -hmm. it continues to unfold. So uh, sky's the limit with that. Um, but let's let's shift gears now into uh, cancer and the next paper that actually is... Um, one of our speakers is on this paper, Dr. Richard Johnson, and it's titled Blocking Fructose Could Be a Novel Approach Against Cancer. Um, so Angela here, who uh, is an expert in this area, is going to take it away and dive right in. Sure. Happy to. So um, this is an interesting one and a little different than a lot of times for our journal club um, uh, discussions. We tend to focus on primary research, um, and this is a review article. So it's it's taking uh, a broad overview of the data that is available on a specific topic. And so this was obviously focusing on how fructose metabolism could be contributing to oncogenesis, uh, which is cancer formation or cancer progression. And this was uh, published in the Journal of Clinical and Experimental Nephrology, came out of a collaboration between a couple groups out of uh, Japan and then also University of Colorado, Denver, which is um, Dr. Richard Johnson, who is the final author of this review paper. That's his uh, his uh, affiliation, the University of Colorado. And as Victoria mentioned, he's going to be a speaker at Metabolic Health Summit. He's not going to be talking about the cancer angle of fructose, to my knowledge. I think he's going to be speaking on the unique role of fructose in um inducing uh, metabolic syndrome, obesity and metabolic syndrome. And his lab has really um, done a lot of the work kind of uncovering those mechanisms, which is pretty cool. So, um, okay. So first of all, we're talking about fructose. Um, it is a naturally occurring sugar that is found primarily in fruits. So sometimes 
It's called fruit sugar. Um, it is a monosaccharide and it gets absorbed into the gut directly into the blood, um, similar to other the other primary monosaccharides, glucose and galactose. So the liver, once it gets to the liver, the liver will uh, convert fructose into glucose as well. And glucose is, of course, the primary monosaccharide present in circulation. Uh, but you do get, you know, fructose uh, as well. And when fructose is bound to glucose, it will, that is a disaccharide. So two uh, monosaccharides uh, bound together. Uh, glucose and fructose makes sucrose, and that is table sugar. So table sugar is 50% fructose, 50% glucose. So, so um, uh, oh, sorry, getting some feedback. I don't know if you guys heard yeah, that. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> That's okay. So probably everyone, you know, listening here is aware that sugar consumption and also specifically fructose consumption is associated with the development of obesity and metabolic syndrome. Um, but kind of the angle that this paper takes from the get-go is, um, how might that be linked to cancer? Because we also know that obesity and metabolic syndrome are both major risk factors for the development of several different types of cancers. And so essentially this review went to the literature and tried to kind of characterize this, the ways that fructose meta metabolism specifically might be contributing to cancer. And they identified a few major ways that it could be doing that. So First, and one of the most obvious, um, is by simply promoting glycolysis. So if you guys listening um, ha have heard some of our other uh, discussions on cancer and cancer metabolism, you are probably familiar with the role that glucose metabolism plays in cancer. It's a primary pathway that really drives growth and proliferation um, of many, many cancer cells. It's, it's very commonly over, over activated in almost all cancers. So in, um, fructose metabolism, fructose is converted into something called fructose one phosphate. Subsequently, at some point it gets metabolized by aldolase B and along with some other enzymatic reactions, it will eventually enter the glycolytic pathway as gly uh, glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So what was interesting is that this enzyme that I mentioned, autolase B, has there's actually research on it looking at the role that it plays in uh, metastasis, metastasis being the spread of a cancer cell from a primary um, location to another place in the body. And that the acquisition of that ability to spread requires a lot of molecular changes within a cancer cell. So a cell, for example, a breast cancer cell in um, mammary tissue uh, does not inherently have the ability to up and decide to leave the breast tissue and go to the lung. It has to acquire these characteristics through changing its uh, genetic, metabolic, and immune kind of landscape. And so there was a paper that showed that adolescent aldolase B um, actually plays an important role in colon cancer, uh, liver metastasis. And in a model that was uh, uh, looking at that specific relationship, they showed that reducing dietary fructose inhibited metastatic spread to the liver in these mice that had this colon cancer. So not only are you kind of like showing the mechanistic pathway by which this is potentially theoretically working, also have some proof of concept there where the animals just re removing the fructose from the diet uh, was able to affect that, which is which is pretty cool. So um, this is a really interesting and, and a novel way that was describing how fructose can enhance aspects of glycolysis to promote tumor growth and progression. So like metastatic spread. So Additionally, um, they talk about how, of course, excess fructose consumption, because it is entering those glycolytic pathways, will push the metabolic phenotype towards glycolytic metabolism and away from mitochondrial respiration and actually, in a way, resemble the Warburg effect. And um, we've talked a lot about the Warburg effect uh, in this um, on this podcast because it's an interesting feature 
of most cancers, wherein they will preferentially uh, metabolize glucose through um, more primitive uh, glycolytic pathways and not send as much of that uh, that glucose carbon into the mitochondria for respiration. Um, and there's a lot of benefits uh, that the Warburg effect bestows onto a cancer cell. So it essentially allows the tumor to save these carbons that are in the glucose molecules and repackage them into um, new building blocks for the tumor. So um, one thing also that the end, end result of the Warburg effect, this uh, aerobic glycolysis, as it's sometimes called, is lactate production. So lactate uh, can uh, also serve as a direct energy source for some cancer cells, but it can also acidify the tumor microenvironment. And lactate in the tumor microenvironment can help degrade that, um, that microenvironment and create an environment that is uh, amenable to invasion and metastasis. So it, it's both from a signaling and like a physical changes way of the, the area surrounding the, the primary tumor, allowing um, that, that cell to be more likely to escape and get into the bloodstream. And of course, as we all know, metastatic spread is, is the whether or not a tumor has spread from the primary site is, is the most important prognostic factor. When tumors are still in their initial location, they're much easier to treat with surgery, standard therapies. Once a cancer has spread, it becomes much harder, much more resistant to treatment, especially in the long term. You often see recurrence. Um, so here's another way through kind of well appreciated mechanisms that excess glucose could be contributing to this enhanced cancer phenotype phenotype so another um way uh, is that fructose can also activate something called the pentose phosphate pathway uh this is an a, a little meta metabolic um branch um off of glycolysis that does a few important things one of which is actually enhancing antioxidant status um, might sound a little counterintuitive, right? That like enhancing antioxidants within the cancer could be a bad thing. Um, but actually, this is something that many, many cancers will do to protect themselves against the damage caused by free radicals. So cancers will create excess free radicals or reactive oxygen species and they actually benefit from that. They It helps them stimulate their growth factor signaling, helps them uh, mutate their genome so they can adapt more quickly. But um, they are still susceptible to having way too, if they have too much oxidative stress, they'll still succumb to cell death. And so cancers will make oh, more free radicals, but then they'll also um, enhance their antioxidants to protect themselves from those free radicals. So they kind of try to get the best of both worlds. So um, fructose metabolism by stimulating pentose phosphate pathway will actually support the cancer's defense against free radicals, oxidative stress. And importantly, um, a lot of our standard therapies work by promoting oxidative stress in the tumor. So many chemotherapies and then radiation therapy especially will cause a lot of oxidative stress. If the tumor is pumping out a lot of antioxidants, it's actually not going to be as responsive to the therapy. So similar to that, um, ribose 5-phosphate is produced by the pentose phosphate pathway. And this is a, is a precursor for synthesis of um, nucleotides and also amino acids. So you get building blocks, again, you're, you're providing these um, molecules that the tumor can then turn around and repackage into a growing cancer. So moving on, this was kind of the more novel um, feature that I, I wasn't really familiar with, and it's related to the production of uric acid. Dominic kind of mentioned earlier that um, Dr. Johnson's group has actually done a lot of work in this field primary research characterizing how fructose metabolism produces uric acid and what those consequences are metabolically. And so 
in particular, you know, they showed that uric acid prevents fructose metabolites from funneling into mitochondrial oxidation. And they, they actually showed this in a liver cancer cell model. Um, now, interestingly, essentially what happens here is uric acid will suppress something called aconitase. And that enzyme basically lies at the junction of acetyl-CoA getting into the mitochondria. When you suppress that, acetyl-CoA is not going into the mitochondria, it's getting shuttled back out into the cytosol, and there it is accumulating and it becomes a uh, precursor stimulating lipid biosynthesis. So again, another really important building block for a tumor. If you think about like tumors are not tumors are new growths. What are new growths? Like of new cells. So you have to have DNA, proteins, lipids for the membranes to grow a new tumor. And these metabolic pathways, this is why metabolism is so important for cancer. It is the way that cancer provides the molecules that it needs to actually grow. And so it was kind of cool just them laying out the different metabolic pathways that fructose can uh, you know, accentuate to promote cancer growth. And of course, you know, this is, this is really interesting. And in theory, obviously could promote oncogenesis cancer progression, but you know, they're also saying, well, is it, is, is this panning out in the real world? And they did a quick review at the end of some, you know, more epidemiological data to kind of support that. Yeah, it, it actually might. So things like there was a study, the nurses' health study, they showed that fructose intake was the strongest risk factor for pancreatic cancer in subjects who are overweight or sedentary. A follow-up analysis showing that sugar-sweetened beverage consumption, which of course also includes uh, fructose, was associated with this risk of, of pancreatic cancer. Theorem concentration of fruc fructose is higher in pancreatic cancer than healthy patients. Um, a correlation between sugar and fructose intake, and the risk of many different cancer types, including colorectal um, and breast. Uh, they also showed that fructose, uh, fructose enzymes such as fructose kinase and then GLUT5, which helps um, transport fructose, are highly expressed in glioma, which is brain cancer, and correlates with poor survival. Um, and then there's, you know, in vitro and animal studies that are able to kind of dive into this a little bit more closely showing that, you know, fructose mechanistically, for example, sh allow assists and aids breast cancer cells in adhering to the endothelium, allowing them to migrate. So supporting that metastatic feature, um, a high fructose diet stimulated breast cancer growth and lung metastasis in a rodent model. And, th and this was true when compared to a glucose or starch controlled diet. So unique features of the fructose molecule itself, not just total kind of like carbohydrate load. And they just said, you know, there's some other studies that have shown similar effects in lung cancer, et cetera. So taken together, um, really interesting data set that is, is clearly worth, you know, thinking about because especially of how much fructose is consumed by the average person. Um, and especially if, <laughs> if people are are drinking these sugar sweetened beverages, consuming products with high fructose corn syrup. Um, this is a real, a real issue. And we've thought about fructose a lot as being really bad for you metabolically. And now it's like, okay, maybe it's also just as bad in terms of like cancer um, predisposition. So it, it like with excess glucose consumption. So, or fructose, right. sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's, it's, it's kind of uh, interesting when you kind of bring all of those pieces of the puzzle together and <laughs> look at the case like that, you're kind of like, okay, well, sounds like we should probably not be consuming a whole lot of fructose uh, and, and maybe look into allulose. No, I'm, I can, uh, but it's yeah. uh, kind of wild to, to take a look at it in that capacity and, and just the, the review and how it sort of brings all of these pieces together. Um, and what that could mean in terms of uh, potential therapeutic against, yeah. um, you know, trying to, you know, reduce cancer growth uh, for for some people and and specific cancer types. It sounds like too that are a little bit more susceptible to um, sugar specifically. It gives a target too because <clears throat> it uses exclusively fructose exclusively uses the GLUT five, 
transporter and no other transporter. And that's also the transporter that allulose uses. So it is in a way a GLUT5 uh, transporter uh, antagonist. So it can block uh, fructose. And we know that the GLUT5 transporter is vastly upregulated in so many different cancers. And then the, the fructose via GLUT5 stimulates uh, proliferation mm-hmm. and, uh, and DNA synthesis uh, to the same extent in, in at least pancreatic cancer cells as glucose. So yeah. there's a study on that. So you have at least, uh, I think in the paper, the review, there's like 16, 17 articles, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, breast, lung, acute myeloid le- leukemia, AML, glioma, and then hepatocellular carcinoma. All these cancers are driven by fructose. And we know it's through GLUT5 uh, expression, overexpression to some extent, similar to hexakinase 2, which is overexpressed in cancer yeah. cells. And we have a sweetener that could potentially block that <laughs> and replace that uh, and function as an antagonist. So that's actually helping us develop some testable hypotheses, which we want to see if allulose has specific effects at decreasing proliferation and growth in different cancer cell lines. So yeah, that'll be fascinating <laughs> to yeah. see uh, what happens there. I mean, it's uh just really exciting uh, research in, in terms of like uh, what this means for the future of, of cancer therapy specifically and, and how this this all just involves food as, as we've been talking about, you know, this metabolic link. It's, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about food that's really simple to grab in your, your kitchen or not. And so mm-hmm. I, kind of diving into some of this research is really exciting in terms of what it could mean. Um, especially for people who may not have a whole lot of options. Uh, I think, uh, there's like, you know, I've said this before, specifically with cancer patients and whatnot, reducing things like sugar is something that a cancer patient can do themselves and feel empowered, um, by doing right in, in the fight against what they're dealing with. And, and that goes a long way in terms of mindset and, um, just every, every other effect on the body beyond just like the metabolic effects and just what that means for the person as a whole, just being an active participant, um, so food is just a powerful tool and it's really exciting to, to dive into both of these papers. And we're going to be diving way more, uh, into detail, uh, at metabolic health summit, 2024 around cancer. We have an entire symposium dedicated to cancer, um, yeah. neurological health, metabolic disorders. Uh, and as Dom has mentioned, we've got some really cool, fascinating breakout sessions from, you know, mitochondrial health all the way to, um, allulose and, and everything else. So, uh, certainly check out our website. Um, if you've not already, you can actually, um, find our website, metabolicinitiative.com is going to have sort of everything, uh, that we do there. So you've got, um, the metabolic initiative, which is our educational medical, medical education platform, the metabolic link, which is the podcast you're listening to here. And then of course our scientific conference, which is really in person live, you know, with the scientists and the physicians and the people that are doing the work in this great field that you can connect with in person. Um, so head on over to that website or just go to metabolichealthsummit.com if you want to check out the conference. Um, we really kind of dived into some some topics that we'll be discussing there, uh, but barely scratched the surface in terms of what we're going to be diving into at Metabolic Health Summit as a whole. So um, awesome papers today, guys, and thank you so much for taking us through all of them. We'll certainly be back with another episode. Angela, were you going to say say a little something? <laughs> oh, no, I wasn't planning on it. I, must oh, have okay. it <laughs> I thought I cut you off. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, no, it was so great to see you guys and really excited for our next episode. If you have not, um, yet write us a review. If you like this episode, share it with your friends, um, comment, really help us spread the word because the more engagement we get, the more eyes and ears we can get metabolic based therapies and really the cutting edge science into, um, those lives and, and hopefully make some change here in in the medical world. So that's the goal. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me today and, uh, we'll see you on another episode soon. And thank you all for listening and watching. We'll see you soon.